Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and narrow pining till he appeared and the soul felt his worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder praise. A new and glorious morn Fall on your knees Oh, hear the angel voices Oh, night divine Oh, night when Christ was born Let's thank this choir once again for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, choir. Thank you, orchestra, for the Williams, for Hopkins, all of the instrumentalists. What a job well done. And we thank the Lord for that old holy night.
when he was born. Take your Bibles, if you have a Bible, and turn to the book of Luke, once again, chapter 2. And we're going to take a moment tonight, before we're dismissed, to see scripturally what we have heard musically. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 7 about the greatest gift ever given in this world's history. It says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Children all over this auditorium Children all over America tonight have gifts on their brain. They're trying to think about how to subtly suggest to mom and dad or maybe, maybe grandmother or grandpa what they really need for Christmas. And sometimes parents have gifts on their mind too. And we all get curious. Now my wife has a great system at home. She has all of the children and all of the grandchildren given a nickname every year. And normally uh, it's the name of the reindeer. And so she'll put one of the reindeer's name on the gift and the children will come by and they'll try to guess uh, if they're Rudolph or which uh, reindeer they are. And Terry tries to keep it hidden from them all year long. But they have great curiosity about who's going to receive which gift. And a lot of adults have that curiosity as well. I heard of a lady the other day that was uh, talking to her husband as they were getting ready to go shopping. And she said to her husband, she said, now, honey, this year, let's buy more practical gifts like socks and diamonds and other practical gifts. Now, the shepherds and the wise men and the temple dwellers all were looking for that great gift, for the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible speaks of Jesus in 2 Corinthians 9.15 when it says, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. To describe Jesus, to describe His eternality, to describe His various attributes, His love, His character, His unchangeable nature, to describe his love for you would take forever. And this Christ child was the greatest gift ever given to you and to me. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. But you know the amazing thing about a gift is that while someone may purchase it and wrap it and present it, it must be received in order to be enjoyed. It must be opened. It must be experienced. And as we look into the scriptures, we find that there were many different responses to this great gift. And I want you to think about two or three of those with me right now. I think about the gift of Christ, and I think, first of all, sadly to say, it has often been a gift neglected. A gift neglected. The Bible tells us, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. You know that swaddling clothes were the types of wrappings that were used for burial in the days of the New Testament. A very humble type of cloth and something that was prophetic of why Jesus came in the first place. He was born to die. And Mary wrapped Jesus in the swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger, uh, sort of a stone, hewn out stone feeding trough for animals. She laid him there, the Bible says, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now think of this. Think of this busy innkeeper. Probably a lot of business going on. Caesar Augustus had moved a lot of people into his town for the purpose of paying taxes. He was busy. He was in a hurry. He was not mindful of what was taking place in Bethlehem that evening. And as this innkeeper was doing his work there in Bethlehem, he saw this couple coming, and he saw them merely as people that were in his way. No room for them in the inn. You know, sometimes if we're not careful, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to God, when it comes to God's Son, we can have this same attitude. No room in the inn. I'm a busy businessman. I'm a busy aerospace worker. I'm a commuter. 
I've got a large family. I've got a lot going on. I mean, don't you realize everything that I've got to do? And the Bible says in James 4 and verse 13, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what is on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And so oftentimes we live as though we have thousands of years on this planet and we'll do the God thing someday, but right now we're really busy with super important stuff. But I'm here to remind you of this simple fact tonight. There is nothing more important in this life than knowing Christ as your personal Savior. Nothing. Nothing more important. Not the promotion at work, not the new house, not the new car, not the hobby, not the bicycle, not the jet skis. Nothing is more important than knowing God through Jesus Christ. And sometimes all of us can get so busy that we mess up in life and we forget to tend to the main priorities of life. I heard about a lady who decided to send checks to all of her relatives for Christmas and her children, her grandchildren, and so forth. And so each person on the list received a card. And the, the card said, uh, buy your own presents this year. And so she sent out several dozen of those uh, cards. And it was about six months later she discovered a stack of checks that she thought she had put inside those cards. <laughs> she had gotten so busy she had missed the most important thing. No room in the inn. No room in the inn. You know, Pastor Chapel, COVID has come and we've got to be so careful. And you know, our company policy is that we've got to be so busy. And you know, there's so many demands on my life these days and I've got to be so very careful. I'm just not sure there's really room on my daytimer for God, you know. The pressures of life. I try to imagine why this innkeeper would have no clue as to what is going on. Maybe it had something to do with the priorities of his life. Maybe he was so concerned about tending to his business that he forgot uh, the spiritual matter just before him. And it seems like people tend to neglect God for a variety of different reasons. The material man oftentimes has no room for God. And if the Bible says in Mark 8, 36, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? How many men do we know? And boy, they're busy with a job and sometimes two jobs and sometimes putting in for overtime and sometimes helping with this and with that. And it's, it's a great work ethic, but oftentimes the material man gains much but loses his own soul. The intellectual man, oftentimes he understands science so-called. He understands perhaps a realm of history or perhaps he understands a, an area of education in some way of expertise and yet with all of his intellectualism oftentimes neglects the simplicity of the gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Greeks seek after wisdom. There are many today who seek after wisdom and intellectualism, but never come to the childlike faith of saying, God, I know that I'm a sinner, and I believe that you sent Jesus to die for my sin. And I now receive Jesus as my Savior. The material man often has no room in the inn. The intellectual man often has no room in the inn. The religious man sometimes has no room in the inn. Oh, Jesus, God had no son. Oh, Jesus, he's just another prophet. Oh, Jesus, he's just a good teacher. I mean, I, I like hearing a little bit about Jesus, but as far as like opening up my heart and trusting in Jesus alone, well, I'm just a little broader in my thoughts that way. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 and verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Some rejected, 
But those who accepted him were born into the family of God. Are you in God's family tonight? Or have you been a little too busy? I see tonight in the scriptures that sometimes the gift is neglected. No room in the inn. And then sometimes the gift is rejected. It's not so much that this person is just busy. It's that this person has developed a hard-heartedness toward God. There is not a one that pictures this more so than Herod the Great in the Christmas story. You read about him in Matthew chapter 2. He ruled from 37 uh, to 4 BC. Herod was a ruthless and a cruel man. He had both of his wives and his sons executed. How many of you would agree with me? Pretty tough customer indeed. Herod the Great, a paranoid leader. He was ruler of the land when Jesus was born. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 2 that the wise men had come to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. They came to Jerusalem looking for the king of the Jews. And and when Herod heard uh, about this Jesus, the Bible says that he was troubled. Imagine that, a mighty man, a man who could have his own family killed at his own word. When he heard about a little baby that had been born, he was troubled. The insecurity of a politician, the insecurity of this ruler who wanted to hold power in his own hands. He wanted no rival for his throne. He wanted to be the king of his own life. And in Matthew 2 and verse 7, the Bible says, Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently about the star that had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. He was a politician that was going to get religion. He was going to feign an interest in Jesus. But in fact, he wanted to take the life of Jesus. He faked this desire. The Bible says in verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. The Bible says that Herod was exceeding wroth. Uh, The Greek word thermos, meaning he heated up and he boiled up. And I say to you tonight that there are men in this world who so desire control, who so desire to be the king of their own life, that they are filled with anger. And they do not receive Christ. They reject Christ because Christ is an impediment to what they want to do in their own kingdom's making. And they reject God. And they take His name in vain. And they cast out words against Christ, and they use Christ's name in vain, and they are filled with hatred. And I'm going to tell you something. There is no greater hatred in one's life than in the life of someone who came close to knowing Christ, but rejected him instead. And you can study history. You can study the lives of Hitler and Karl Marx and many others. And you will find that in their childhood, they had a knowledge of God. They had some exposure to a Sunday school or a church bell or they came close to the truth of Jesus but they chose to reject and a man who rejects Christ a woman who rejects Christ often is a hard hearted and a hateful person oh God gave the gift and yet many have neglected it there's just no room and others have rejected it They will have no rivals. They will be the king of their own life. They will not accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. They will be the Lord of their own schedule. They will be the Lord of their own life. They will be in charge and have it their way. Well, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a gift. The perfectly sinless Son of God. And yet many have neglected this gift. They've never opened it. They've never experienced it. Many have rejected this gift like Herod rejected the gift. But thank God, 
Hundreds of millions of people have received this gift. They have received. They have accepted it. Some neglected. Some rejected. But when you read the Christmas story, many, many accepted. They made room in their heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us about a man named Simeon in the temple at Jerusalem. There came a moment in time when Mary and Joseph would leave Bethlehem and walk up the valley to the steps of the temple and up into the temple for the dedication of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was an elderly man there whose name was Simeon. In Luke 2.25, the Bible says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. This means that he had been waiting for the Messiah. He had been waiting for the Christ, the Son of God. And he was in the temple as a man believing that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. What a tremendous faith he had. What a tremendous opportunity. And he waited very, very patiently for the coming of the Lord. Again, we struggle with patience, do we not? I came across a little letter that a child wrote to Santa Claus. He said, Dear Santa, you did not bring me anything good last year. You did not bring me anything good the year before. This is your last chance, signed Alfred. A lot of people are like that. God, I want you to deliver what I want you to give me on my terms. But Simeon was not that way. He was a patient, a godly man. In fact, the spirit of the living God rested upon him. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the salvation of Israel, for the Christ child. He lived with that anticipation. By the way, he was anticipating the first coming of Jesus, and we are anticipating the second coming of Jesus Christ. And there is room today for men and women who have a godly anticipation. But we see in the Scriptures not only his anticipation, but as we close tonight, we see his salvation. We see this man, Simeon, in chapter 2 and verse 27, it says, And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law, the Bible tells us that Simeon took this child, imagine, imagine holding the creator of the world, imagine holding God in the flesh, imagine holding deity wrapped in humanity, looking into the eyes of the Son of God, And Simeon, holding the Lord Jesus, said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Simeon did not walk into the temple every day and say, Oh God, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. For salvation is not to be found in the stones of Herod or the stones of Nehemiah. Salvation is not to be found in a religion. It's not to be found in a denomination. It's not to be found in the goodness of my heart. None of those things gave Simeon salvation. Only when he saw Jesus did he say, Mine eyes have seen my salvation. No church can save you from your sin. No good works can save you from your sin. You can give money to every charity. You can try, try, try. But the Bible says, for by grace are you saved. And it's not of our works, lest any man should boast. And Simeon said, Lord, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And you may not see God physically tonight, but by faith through hearing the word of God. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And your eyes can be opened tonight to the fact that Jesus wasn't just another guy, that he wasn't just another teacher, that he wasn't just a religious zealot, that he was in fact the virgin born son of God who lived a perfectly sinless life on this planet and then 33 and a half years into that life voluntarily went to the cross of Calvary and there that blood that was spilled was spilled to make sacrifice for all of our sin and when a man gets honest before God and says, God I know that I'm a sinner and I know Jesus Jesus, that you're perfect and you never sin and yet you shed your blood for my atonement. When you really realize the cost of that gift, then you'll say, Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner and I ask you to come into my life. I accept the gift of your salvation 
by faith, for by grace are you saved through faith. This is why Peter said in the book of Acts, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, this is the stone which was set at naught of the builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. My friend, are you saved? Are you saved? J. Vernon McGee, McGee was a great preacher who preached at the Church of the Open Door in Los Angeles. He had a great radio station over here in Pasadena for years and years. And oftentimes, J. Vernon McGee would say, there's two groups of people in the world today. There's the saints and there's the ain'ts. Now, my mother, if she was alive and if she was here tonight, she would say to me, Paul, you should not use the word ain'ts. That's not a proper term in the English grammar. But theologically, it is absolutely true. You see, a saint is not someone up on a wall that we pray to. A saint is someone that is in Christ, set apart. They belong to Christ. They are saved. Sometimes we refer to believers as the saints of God. They have received Christ and His redemption, and they are saved. The saints and the ain'ts, those that neglected Christ, those that rejected Christ. They just never took the time to receive Christ. You see, the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. All of us have sinned. Pastors have sinned. Priests have sinned. Religious people sin. We have all sinned. Can I tell you about the race problem in the world? It's called the human race, and we all have a problem, and all of our problem is sin. For all have sinned, red, yellow, black, brown, white. All of us have sinned, but Jesus died for all of us because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The wages of my sin is separation from God. It is spiritual death. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I deserve a one-way ticket to hell. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this is where religion many times messes up the gospel. Because salvation is not something that we earn. When I asked you if you're saved, you probably thought, oh, I better, I better give a little more money. I better be a little nicer to the dog. I guess I have to be nice to the cat. I don't know. I got to do enough to get saved. But salvation is not something you earn. It's something that you receive. Now, let's say that I went out to a nice store, a real nice store, like Dollar General or one of those. <laughs> let's say I bought, they're, they're charging a buck fifty for some things at Dollar General, so don't laugh at me. <laughs> let's maybe say I went someplace a little nicer than that. And let's say that I purchased a present for my wife, Terry, and, and I put a lot of thought into it, and, and I had it all nicely wrapped. And let's say that I brought it to Terry. How you doing over here, sweetheart? Here it is, right here. And I said, honey, now, now I want you to take this. I, I spent a lot of money on this, and I want you to take it. It's all wrapped so pretty. And uh, sweetheart, all you have to do to receive this is just um, rub my shoulders every night, <laughs> roast beef and potatoes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That'd be fine. Teriyaki chicken on Tuesday, okay? <laughs> and uh, th that's all you have. To, now that's all you have to do. You, you have to smile always at me. I want you to be up before me every morning with coffee going, if you don't mind. And if you'll do all that, I'll give you this gift. Now. She's not smiling at me right now. <laughs> and um, if that's how you have your Christmas, we do have marriage counseling here at Lancaster Baptist Church. <laughs> because if Terry has to do anything to receive this, it's not a gift. You see, religion says, do this, do this, do this, and then hope you get to heaven. But Jesus says, 
I already paid for it. All you have to do is receive it. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. May I suggest to you that God knows what you need more than anyone on this planet knows what you need. If your greatest need had been political, God would have sent a diplomat. If your greatest need had been medical, God would have sent a doctor. If your greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been financial, God would have sent an economist. If our greatest need was in the realm of the material, God would have sent a philanthropist. But God knew that our greatest need was forgiveness. And so God sent a Savior. A Savior. And we have the choice tonight. Very simple choice. We can neglect this Savior. We can reject this Savior like so many hateful people are doing tonight. Or like Simeon, we can say, I receive you, Lord. Mine eyes have seen your salvation. Mine eyes have been opened to the fact that salvation is a gift and Jesus paid for the gift. And Lord, I now receive the gift. Friend, have you received that gift? I'm not trying to embarrass. I would not ever do that. I'm trying to encourage you tonight. Are you saved? If not, why not trust Christ tonight? And if not now, when? And if not here, where? For the Word of God says, behold, today is the day of salvation. Would you join me in a word of prayer tonight? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this gift. We thank you that on that holy night, you sent forth your Son, wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger, and ultimately dying upon a cross. And we thank you and we praise you. And we thank you that we don't have to earn our salvation, but that it is a gift for all who believe. Now, Lord, help us with the Word of God as a mirror. Help us, Lord, to see and discern what we need. And then help us to respond in faith. With our heads remaining bowed and our eyes closed, I want to thank you for listening so wonderfully tonight. And I would like you to ponder this question. Are you saved? Have you received the gift? I'm not asking if you're religious or a church member. I'm not asking about your family history. Just do you know that your sins are forgiven? That you have understood and received Christ as your Savior? All over this room tonight, there are people with different experiences. Perhaps some who've just been a little busy. You've been neglectful like the owner of the inn. Maybe some have been caught up into the rhetoric of this world like Herod. And you've just been angry about spiritual things. And tonight is that night when you need to turn to Christ and simply accept the gift. I wonder tonight with heads bowed and eyes closed how many in this auditorium can say Pastor Chapel, I remember when God opened my eyes and I realized that as a sinner I needed a Savior and I realized that God sent His Son to be my Savior and I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior I believe the wages of sin is death but the gift of God Jesus that's eternal life. And I believe tonight that I have the gift of eternal life because I've been saved. I've received Christ as my Savior. And if that is your testimony tonight, and you know based upon the Word of God that you're saved, that's a wonderful thing. If you're not sure, listen closely as we close tonight. 
But if you're sure tonight that you're saved, can you give a testimony of that by your uplifted hand tonight? Just say, here's my hand. I've, I remember when I was saved, and I'm glad that I was. Thank you for your honesty tonight. Now, how about those of you that are here with me tonight, and you say, Pastor, I heard the music. It was uplifting. I heard the message, and I realized, Pastor Chapel, that I've kind of been approaching this knowing the Lord in the wrong way. I've been approaching it like I've got to do a lot of stuff. But tonight I realized that Jesus already paid for my sin, that I simply, by faith, need to receive Christ as my Savior. And how many of you that did not raise your hand a moment ago, maybe you're a single adult, maybe you're here as a married couple or just as friends, it doesn't matter. How many of you tonight who did not raise your hand would say, Pastor Chapel, I would like to know definitively that I am saved, that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and that one day I'll see Him in heaven again. And if there's a way to know that, then I want to get that settled tonight. And if you didn't lift your hand a moment ago, but you'd like to get that settled, why don't you right now let me pray for you? Would you just very kindly just slip your hand up right now? Just hold it up. I want to get it settled that I'm saved and that heaven is my home. Hold your hand right up. I want to pray with you. If there's someone like that, I want to get this settled in my heart that Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. Don't be embarrassed. If there's someone like that, just hold your hand right up. I want to pray for you and ask God to help you tonight to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you came here at the invitation of a friend. Maybe you heard about the church some other way. I want to get this settled in my heart and in my life. Is there someone like that? Let me pray with you tonight. We want to encourage you to trust Christ as your Savior. And I think there's one or two hands here. There may be some others. Maybe you're a little bashful about raising your hand. That's okay. But I want to have prayer for you tonight. Maybe there's a Christian tonight who'd say, Pastor Chapel, I've accepted Christ as my Savior, but lately I've acted more like the innkeeper than the shepherds. I've been a little too busy to go around serving Jesus. And as a Christian, I don't want to live the life of an innkeeper. I want to live the life of a shepherd excited about my Christ. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand as a Christian tonight? Is God speaking to your heart? Is it time to come back to the Lord, back to serving the Lord? I want to pray with you about that as well. Would you stand with me tonight, please, very quietly? And our Father, we thank you that we can call you Father. We thank you that you welcome us into the family by way of the gift of salvation. And I pray that as Christians, we would not be so busy that we would miss the miracle right in front of us. Help us to live for you, not merely for the things of this world. And then, Lord, I want to pray for those right now in this room who may not know you as their Savior. Maybe tonight was the first time when they actually heard a man open a Bible and really explain that salvation is actually a gift. So Lord, wherever they are on their spiritual journey, I pray that that journey would lead them to Christ, that they would see their need for a Savior, that they would turn to Christ alone as their salvation. And I pray and I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Before we're dismissed tonight, we're going to have a moment of, of an invitation. I'm going to ask some of our pastoral staff to come here to the front. We're going to sing a final song. John will lead us in that song. If you don't know the words, don't worry about it. But if you're with us tonight or you brought a friend tonight, I want to encourage you before you head back out into the Antelope Valley, that before you leave this place, that you just open your heart and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'd like to take just two or three minutes. You've already heard the way and just help you to pray to the Lord and seek His face. If you know the Lord and you want to come and pray about something else, you're looking for a church home to serve Christ in, you've got questions about these things, you come as well. Right now, as we hear this song, you step out. If you would like to receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you come right now as we sing. Have your way, Don't let Lord, anything hold you back. You come if God spoke in your heart. You're He's the, the potter, potter, we're the clay. I'm if you're not saved, I want to encourage you to come. Hold and make me yours today. Have your way, Lord, have your way. Let's sing that together now. 
Have your way, Lord, have your way. You're the potter, I'm the clay. Mold and make me yours today. Have your way, Lord, have your way. It's been a wonderful night. Let's thank the choir again for such a wonderful presentation of the gospel. Thank you, choir and orchestra. So proud of our choir and thankful for that great testimony. And I want to just make a couple of quick announcements rather than show the full video. Let me remind you of a few things. If you did not receive the prayer magnet, a beautiful reminder of the revival coming in January, a lot of the events of our church in 2022, stop by the guest service tables and pick one of those up and put it on your refrigerator so that you can be mindful and prayerful about events coming up just around the corner. Don't forget our connection groups, our small groups will meet this Wednesday night. If you're new to Lancaster Baptist, not sure which one to attend, ask one of us. There'll be a lot of us out in the lobbies. In fact, let me ask some of our pastoral staff, make your way out there right now and ask any of these men and uh, they'll be glad to help you if you have questions about a class on Wednesday night. And then next Sunday morning, uh, we'll have a great time and Sunday evening uh, with guest star, uh, guest uh, musician, rather, Dennis Agajanian. And he's a tremendous blessing, and you'll enjoy meeting him and hearing his music. And then we'll be preaching, of course, next Sunday as well. Our Christmas Eve service is at 5 o'clock, December the 24th. I believe that's a Friday night this year. And so we'll look forward to that. Some great things are planned on Christmas Eve as well.